Hi everyone and welcome to our Friday wellness webinar, uh, the AIHM webinar. We are so excited to be here today with Dr. Mary Hardy um, and thank you all. Last week we had some technical difficulties and so we had to reschedule and just wanted to apologize Dr. Hardy for you. Um, I'm really appreciative that you're here with us today. Um, so I am going to share my screen and just as you're coming in, if you want to put in the chat where you're coming in from, we're so excited to have everyone and we've got a lot of um, registrants today. So I'm going to share my screen here. And can you guys see that presentation? Yes, it's all, it's visible. All right, so um, today is, um, I just want to let everyone know that um, this video is for informational purposes and we always um, recommend seeing, uh, seeking the advice of your physician or qualified healthcare provider with any questions you have regarding a medical condition um, before undertaking any diet, dietary supplement, exercise, or uh, other health program changes. So, um, you know, this webinar series is open to everyone, but is really designed for licensed clinicians. Um, so I uh, just wanted to mention that. And the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, um, we are an interprofessional organization that is bringing together the global integrative community of clinicians, education, educators, researchers, um, and other providers to really help transform our healthcare system. So today our special guest is Mary Hardy. Um, Mary is uh, founded the Integrative Medicine Clinic at Cedar sinai in LA in 1998. Uh, she has extensive experience in evaluating evidence um, for efficacy and safety of CAM. She served on and chaired several United States Pharmacopeia expert committees, um, as well as many other um, really just in incredible, the work you've done, Mary, over the years. She's been such a leader for all of us and to many of our clinicians and the leaders in integrative health, they really look to Mary and her research and the work that she does. Um, Mary is an active fellowship uh, faculty. So she teaches many of the courses in the AIHM fellowship and we're just really excited to have her today um, presenting on some of the clinical um, considerations that we have been um, being asked about by our community. So I am going to stop my share screen um, and allow um, Mary you to do your presentation for us. And just so you all okay, know, so we are going to um, have this go 90 minutes today. So for those of you who can stay on longer, please please feel free to do that. We record and live stream all of our wellness webinars. So if you're not able to stay on for the full time, you can go to um, our um, YouTube channel or our um, Facebook channel at AIHM Global um, or to our website afterwards and see the live recording. But all of the comments and our questions and this presentation will be recorded and available to you all after. Yes. You can see all my slides? Good, okay. Well, we made it. Congratulations to us. So thank you everybody for patiently waiting for this presentation. Um, I will tell you that the benefit of being a week delayed is that there is a ton more information. And um, it's like drinking from a really big fire hose, as you all know. Um, I'd first like to thank Tabby and Brian and Nicole and Jess and AIHM for making it possible for me to talk to you guys about this. I think it's a hugely important topic. Um, just to be clear, what we're going to talk, what we're going to cover is the material you see here. Um, you know, introduction, resistance, resilience, replacement, etc. We're going to look at things to support the immune system. We know that we have both the adaptive and the um, uh, innate immune system. We're gonna to refer to those routinely. This is just a, um, a way for you to see that as well. To be very, very clear uh, about what our, 
our therapeutic stance is there currently is no cure for COVID. Remdesivir is the best we've got, and it um, the effect on mortality is not so clear, but the, the shortening of serious disease is clear. So that's the good news about that, but no supplement has been shown to be a cure. There is more evidence about um, supportive care, and we're going to talk about that. Now, just to remind you about all the things that surround immune function that make it work better, it's all the stuff that's right in our wheelhouse. Healthy left lifestyle, maintaining adequate weight, optimizing diet, uh, avoiding uh, toxic exposure, moderating stress, sleeping well, exercising, etc. So these are the basics that we're going to use to start this off with. First of all, you should really, as we know, aim for seven hours of good quality sleep. Do all the good sleep hygiene stuff that goes along with that. Um, sleep initiates the adaptive immune system where you convert from the innate immune system to the adaptive immune system. This is a critical critical stage that allows you to take the antigen as presented and then um, incorporate it into the adaptive immune system. It also allows T cells to come out of the blood system into the periphery. And if you are, if, if you wonder why when you're, you haven't slept enough, you feel achy and kind of weird and um, that's because sleep impairs the good cytokine production. And uh, if you're chronically sleep deprived, you're not going to convert uh, to a vaccine very well. And that's a sign of an impaired immune system. In this slide, please notice that, that all of this in, um, innate to an adaptive immune system conversion happens here, in this place right here. And that then allows this to happen. Th1 response bumps up, B cells and cytotoxic T cells get activated. Now, exercise, we know how important exercise is for general health. And this is, um, this is very important for maintaining our ongoing regular health, cardio, cardio, cardiac immune system, uh, uh, its effect on um, endorphins, et cetera. A lot of us are finding it really difficult to maintain our usual exercise routines so we've been bumped out of our gyms or the places where we like to go hiking are too crowded or closed. But just remember that you still can exercise you have to find a way to do it safely. If you can expose yourself to nature, that's even better. The, um, it's especially important if you have someone who's elderly that they don't remain sedentary. That again helps prime the immune system. It also helps us sleep better too, which then puts us back into the same cycle of sleep helping immunity, helping everything. Now, the one caveat here is very um, aggressive immune system, I mean, very aggressive exercise actually dampens the immune system for a variable period of time. So this is not the time to be training for your, um, for your triathlon or running your marathon, but luckily or unluckily, many of us don't have that exact issue. Um, now, so there are lots of mind-body therapies that are important for immune health. And there's lots of ways to get at this. We all know about this in many, many ways. So again, this is our bailiwick. Most of us know about teaching or using meditation or yoga, et cetera. If you, we're gonna talk later on about the, actually what stress does to suppress the immune system, that will come a little bit later. But you should know that um, managing this manages cortisol expression, which again then is a dampener on the immune system. Again, I wanna call your attention to three things that are probably particularly nice right now. The first one is, um, Nature exposure. Nature exposure is very healing in many, many ways. And it's done as a, a, a rigorous practice in Japan called forest bathing. But you can do this um, either by finding a nice place to sit, a tree to sit under. It doesn't have to be, you know, the savanna in Africa or, uh, you know, a beautiful uh, Western forest. It can be even just a small piece of nature. If, if that's even difficult or not safe, you can use virtual exposures. Also to remind you that the, the degree to which we're connected and interact with each other, that really helps with joy, happiness, peace. And so be sure to not lose track of that. And even in these times when there seems much more to be upset about than to be grateful for, practicing a daily gratitude practice, and it can be as simple as writing down three things that you're grateful for, 
This has been shown in, in research by Robert Emons to um, improve mood, decrease anxiety, and improve sleep. Now, um, I want to remind everybody that that uh, staying hydrated is critical to having a functional immune barriers at the first level. So therefore, you guys have to be sure to remind your patients to drink enough and also to eat enough foods that have a lot of water. So pizza is not really the best high water food, but I would note, have you note that things like um, berries, melons, other things like that are very useful for adding extra water content to food. Now, foods in general that are really good, again, it's back to our classic diet that we know about. You wanna choose so that you have both micro and macro um, nutrients that are adequate. And this is very good if you, don't, if you aren't well nourished with all the problems about finding food and to talk about the, the um, supply getting stressed and food being thrown away before it can get to people. Think about the bright colored fruits and vegetables. Again, make that the building block of your diet. Healthy proteins, they don't have to be meat-based proteins, they can be plant-based proteins, but have enough of that as well now. Um, so these are the foods as we, as we use all the time. Now, I'm going to stop this for a second and move to a different presentation. The interesting thing is um, we have been great advocators for maintaining nutrition during any state of presentation. You can always look for wellness, even in acute issues like cancer, et cetera, even during COVID. It's often the case when people are acutely ill that this emphasis on nutrition um, and being adequately nourished gets um, devalued or pushed to the side or just not noticed in the grand scramble of trying to get really pressing medical issues met. But I think it's interesting to note that even during um, even during the time of COVID in, in um, China, there was a lot of awareness about foods that provided the micronutrients that we need, vitamin A, C, E, B6, 12, zinc, and iron. And um, it's important when people come to be presented for treatment that you evaluate the nutritional status because even people you don't expect to be ill, don't expect to be malnourished or undernourished often are, especially the elderly. So adequate calories, high quality, and whey protein um, is recommended if extra protein supplementation is needed because of the immune positive effects and protection against protein, uh, protein muscle wasting. These are the immune, uh, these, are those, these are the same micronutrients that we've talked about a couple of times. They, and they have um, activities all across the um, uh, immune system. Don't try to read this. Take down, the, uh, take down the reference. This is a terrific summary of all the places in which micronutrients act in the immune system. So you want that for reference for later. And likewise, you want this reference for later as well. Um, this is what happens to your immune system as at different ages. And it's important to remember that you do have to do some nutritional, um, you do have to do some nutritional fitting of the patient to the um, immune prescription, immune nutrition prescription over age. So requirements and status change over time. The most important thing to remind you of is that there is a natural immune senescence that happens as people age. And that immune senescence, that decrease in the immune system over time is one of the reasons that the elderly are so, um, are so at risk, okay? And the status of immune nutrition, nutritional readiness, immune readiness may explain part of the variability in response that we've seen. There are other um, things as well too. Let's go on now and start to take a look at the first set of immune nutrients that are, have the best data. And this is gonna kind of be in the order of the highest order of data going down. And I'm gonna show you how I constructed this, um, this string of evidence so that you can see what, what really is rigorous and, 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 and has a good safety profile and what you may wanna consider for your patients. So first of all, it's, it's important to note that um, vitamin C is a key nutrient here. It tends to go lower with age, again, part of the immune senescence. And as soon as you have an active infection, vitamin C gets used up and the needs increase. It has a lot of activities. It's very protective for the um, foot soldiers of the immune system, neutral 
neutrophils, et cetera. There's been studies that have shown that up to three grams in adult and 20 milligrams per kilogram per day in children enhances chemotaxis and T cell proliferation. It improves natural killer activity. It enhances, um, it enhances mediated immunity, even in the elderly. So again, this is a very good thing to do for your patients who are at high risk. And you notice here that the dose is quite low, only one gram. This study added a little bit of vitamin E as well. It stimulates interferon production. And if you're insufficient, you, you, can't, you can't process your antigens properly and respond to them properly. Vitamin C was also actively included in protocols for during the SARS virus. And the virus we're dealing with now, the COVID-19, is another coronavirus with over 90% concordance of the DA between the two, the RNA, excuse me, between the two viruses. So it's not an unreasonable extrapolation to assume that what worked in one would probably work in the other. This is an interesting study that looked at the effect of supplemental vitamin C on the incidence of pneumonia. You can see that it's, it, it did decrease the incidence of pneumonia. It increased the um, severity, and, and you, you know the evidence about length of colds, and we'll look at that in a second. So again, this was very helpful in a variety of different kinds of patients. Community-acquired pneumonia, uh, males with their increased risk, middle-aged males of another another study in Finland, and then children as well as military recruits. So this is, so we know that vitamin C can reduce um, infection rates just of pneumonia. We also know the data about viral colds and how vitamin C does help with the, not so much the incidence of colds, but the severity and the length of illness. I also want to point out to you something very interesting. It, it also seemed to be more protective in people who were higher risk, so people who had access to children are higher risk of getting colds, so the vitamin C was effective. If you tended to have more colds, it was more effective. It was much more effective on men than women, and um, in fact, in women, it was not as protective. But this is again because these are the this is the differential that the virus is showing us about gender. So there may be even an added sub benefit uh, for male patients as well. Now there is potentially some risk of adding vitamin E to vitamin C. This is the ATC study, which, as we all know, has lots of caveats attached to it, and it seems to suggest that the risk of TB and pneumonia went up with the, with the supplementation with vitamin C and E. Again, I, you know, this is very, very secondary data from this study. It, it also, there are also are studies that show that vitamin E supplementation mildly, not a lot, but some, has been helpful. And this population was not a typical population that we're seeing in the United States in particular. Now, looking at this, this is probably the closest piece of data that makes me really think that this is useful. There was a series of studies, 18 studies, um, uh, including over 2,000 patients looking at a combination of, follow, you know, just not ill going into the hospital, but needing cardiac surgery and other surgeries. And then another set of studies that showed people with acute illness, including ARDS. Vitamin C in these studies was given in a variety of ways, either intravenous or by mouth. And there was overall a very nice benefit, about 8% decreased length of stay in the ICU about again an 8% to 9% um, length of stay decrease even for oral vitamin C, not just for IV vitamin C, and the dose was on average two grams per day. Um, what's particularly interesting is there were three studies looking at patients who had more than three days of mechanical ventilation, and this shortened the duration of the need for mechanical ventilation by 18%. So whether this in the long run benefits the individual patient and their recovery, I think it would, but it certainly might help us manage scarce resources when access to ventilators can be a limiting factor for uh, full care management. Now, this is a slide that's out of place. I'm going to come back to it. So here's the vitamin C um, looking at patients in the ICU. So you can see the top set of studies is intravenous, and it shows, again, the forest plot with the, at the null point here. And this is the place where the sum of all the studies, and it shows a benefit, again, like we said, about 10% benefit, so very useful. And again, this is oral, and again, about the same benefit. Okay, come on, little puppy. All right, these are the Kaplan-Meier curves, the mortality curves, and you can see this is the dose with placebo alone. 
and this is the dose with the added vitamin C. The curves separate almost immediately, and that differential is maintained until both curves plateau around 30 days. So there is value in doing this, and there's value giving this to patients, um, even in acute settings. Okay. okay. Now, in particular for COVID-19, there were, there were several studies done in China. One particular study looked at patients, there's a lot of these descriptive studies. And so many of these studies showed high, um, high CRP, high inflammatory, high oxidative stress. We all know this. And we know that vitamin C can intervene and moderate each of those conditions. But there was a particular study that used over 50 patients, treated 50 patients with moderately severe disease. And they gave them anywhere from 10 to 20 grams over eight to 10 hours. And as in real time, as they were treating patients, their oxygenation index improved, which means their pulmonary function improved. All the patients who were treated this way survived and were discharged. And it has been included in the guidelines for use in um, China, in the, in the official guidelines. And it, it also, they, they postulated that it was useful for the prevention of the cytokine storm, which has been the cause of so much of the, the um, just lung damage in COVID-related ARDS. Uh, one trial has already been registered at clinicaltrials.gov. has been planned to be used in 140 patients. IV vitamin C, the dosage as noted, is going to be given 24 hours continuously, and a variety of outcomes of interest, such as those listed there, will be done. Um, so I think this is something you should be thinking about for your patients, um, especially if it looks like they're having progressive disease. Now, I'm going to go back for the slide that was in the wrong place. So vitamin D has um, a, a whole lot of effects on the immune system. It affects the innate and adaptive immune systems. It reduces the risk of both uh, viral and, micro and bacterial infections. It's very good, especially in the innate system at maintaining tight junctions, which in the first presentation of a virus to the body, those go through the nasal and the lung system where those tight junctions are part of the defense of a virus invasion into the body. It um, enhances innate immunity, as we discussed before. The details are there. It reduces cytokine storm that's induced by sort of an uncontrolled stimulus of the innate system that doesn't get tamped down. The innate system is the first response. It gives a big hit, but then after that first presentation, it's supposed to be moderated and turned down so that the other adaptive system can take over the main um, immune response. So it's very good at reducing pro-inflammatory Th1 cytokines and increases the production of anti-inflammatory cytokines, which, which I think will be very critical in, in limiting lung damage. It also enhances expression of the genes that are related to glutathione production predominantly in the liver. And as we all know, glutathione is one of the innate most powerful antioxidants in the body. Okay, back to where we were. This again just gives you a look at how vitamin D actually affects the innate immune system. It increases the physical barrier function, and it starts off the uh, phagocytosis, et cetera. And this is, I think, the key one to look at more closely. This is the effect on the adaptive immune system. And you can see here that a lot of the actions of vitamin D stop the production of inflammation. And at that point, out of control inflammation is not helpful. You, you need enough so that you can have chemotaxis come in and start the immune response. But if, you, if it goes out of control, then you end up with a cytokine storm. Now, we do know that vitamin D levels affected by geographic location in the country, or in the world, basically. We don't really know so much about the seasonal variation of COVID, but it's something to keep in mind. We know that certain groups are at high risk for low vitamin D, and we should keep those groups in mind. The elderly, especially nursing home patients who get very little exposure to sun, diabetics, the obese, because the obese sequester more vitamin D into their fat, people with dark skin who don't get as much um, UV, UV radiation penetrating to the sun to convert to vitamin D, and anyone with compromised immune function. Certain drugs tend to lower vitamin D, and I've listed some of the major ones are there. There also are, um, are um, vitamin D receptor polymorphisms, both just for binding and also there's CYP3A4 polymorphisms. And if certain polymorphisms are present, they can increase the risk of lower respiratory infection. Now, 
this again may account for some of the variability that we've seen. If people have a low vitamin D, their vitamin D receptors don't promote rapid absorption or effective absorption. And if in fact they have um, other kinds of imp impeding mechanisms inactive, active in these patients, then their response may be um, affected to the uh, COVID presentation. This is again a quick look at, as we talked about, this is influenza basically. So in the Northern hemisphere, it's in the winter. At the equator, it's about all the year long. And in the Southern hemisphere, it's in what is their winter, our summer. We haven't seen this pattern yet specifically for COVID, but just know that it might still be active. I'll talk to you about that in a second. Here is, this is a look at the evidence of vitamin D in acute respiratory infections. Again, we're building that evidence chain. Is there biological plausibility? Does vitamin D affect the immune system? Has it been shown to be helpful in other, other infections? So far, so good, yes. So you can see here from this um, summed, uh, for this meta-analysis that yes, it has a modest but, but, but significant decrease in the incidence of respiratory, acute respiratory infections. Now, looking specifically at COVID and vitamin D, um, I think it's good for you guys to know that one of your cohort, uh, one of our fellows has been testing vitamin D levels in patients, which I strongly recommend. And he has told me that the, uh, virtually every one of his patients and anyone getting admitted to the hospital nowadays has got to be at least moderately affected, has had a low vitamin D. So this is well worth pursuing and well worth thinking about even in your high risk non-hospitalized patients. So if you look at a cross-sectional analysis of the mean level of vitamin D per European country and morbidity and mortality for COVID, um, there's a significant uh, association with both number of cases and mortality of cases. Without access to vitamin D levels, but you, groups that you expect to be low, you could treat them with 10,000 units for several weeks to raise the levels to the target of 40 to 60 nanograms. This is um, a conventional medicine target. We tend to like to go a little bit higher, but I would still try to um, maintain it below uh, 100 nanograms per ml. There is some report of adverse events over that level. Um, and this 10,000 international unit dos dosage is the tolerable, tolerable upper limit for, um, for, um, for supplementation without, without having a level that you're following. And probably 5,000 international units per day of, um, will maintain uh, levels during this period of risk. Now, if, if you have a patient who's got a very low vitamin D and a very, very sick, you can give high doses for several days for rapid repletion, but try to use the vitamin D levels when able, you're able to. This is looking at that European study. So here's the average per country level of vitamin D, and you can see that the projected line does show a relationship between level of vitamin D and number of COVID cases. And then it also shows the same kind of a line in a level with, of COVID cases with, um, with, de with increasing, decreasing mortality with increasing dose. And if you look here, it looks like probably the, the benefit would accrue around this area, around at least 60 and maybe 70. Same here. Now, melatonin. This is very important in viral, in function, in viral infection. This is a look at a study that looked at melatonin for respiratory syncytial virus. Um, this uh, melatonin has been shown to, to directly affect the lung parenchyma and prevent acute injury, mostly through oxidative mechanisms. Moderates pro-inflammatory cytokines, a key feature that we've been talking about to protect from direct lung in injury. It's antioxidant and it, and it prevents sort of the recruitment of additional uh, cells during inflammatory response. I'm gonna go through this really quickly. So again, this is the antigen presenting cell. This is improved activity on NK cells. It tends to promote the production of uh, CD4 cells and convert them to H1 cells, et cetera, all, all both the, the innate and the adaptive immune system. Okay, now um, melatonin has, there are actions that would make this useful for, um, for, uh, for COVID. So the elderly have reduced melatonin, again, part of their, their well-described senescence, and that their responses tend to be a little bit lower as well. 
So it's, it's um, it, the antioxidant effect is very helpful. It may inhibit apoptosis that's triggered by COVID, which leads to more lung cell damage. An inflammasome was created out of the cytokine storm and out of that inflammasome, which is self-promoting the cytokine storm, um, that's a, a lot of the way in which the damage occurs. But if we have melatonin, it could block the formation of that, which is sort of this cycle of inflammation, recruiting more cells, more cells that damage, et cetera, increase oxidative stress, stimulating more immune cells, all that whole negative cycle there. Um, it also mitigates um, lung fibrosis from a variety of agents, including toxins, other infectious agents, and even maybe radiation. It's also good to notice that melatonin may improve sleep, which is um, an anxiety. It's a central nervous system, has central nervous system activities. And again, this is a, a symptom that deserves to be mitigated to help with general immune function. Now for COVID, we know that melatonin affects a number of pathways. And some of them are inflammatory, like preventing NF-kappa beta, translocation to the nutrius, reduction of cytokines, the CERT-1 pathway. Um, but be careful if you have a very immune suppressed patient, high doses of vitamin, I mean of melatonin, may, up, may actually uh, increase more pro-inflammatory cytokines because with immune suppression, you don't have all the pieces you need to do the suppression on the, at the other end. Um, it up it upregulates um, antioxidative enzymes that break down oxidative species like SADS, um, uh, and it, it also decreases the activity of things like uh, nitrous oxygen synthetase and things that create more free radicals, etc. It modulates the immune system, as I've already told told you, and probably in doses from six to twenty five grams per day, decrease cytokines. Now you're going to say to me, twenty five grams of melatonin. That's a huge dose. It's large. It is large. But you should know that in the um, oncology literature, there's been a series of studies looking at 20 grams, milligrams, sorry, that's a mistake, not a G, in milligrams per day, um, that 20 milligrams per day have been used with apparent safety. I would, however, recommend that you start at a lower dose and talk titrate up if you need to. And just know that there's a percentage of patients, maybe about 10% of patients, who have a paradoxical reaction to melatonin. In other words, it may be more stimulatory than sedating. And it's likely going to give people vivid dreams. So if your patient is awake and able to communicate, you probably should warn them about that. Otherwise, it may be frightening for them. Now, another key micronutrient is zinc. Zinc is a, a very important, it's a gatekeeper for the immune system. It, it really has a lot to do in, initially with prepping the thymus, getting the Th1, Th2 balance correct, uh, pro-inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory. It produces, um, uh, it, 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 it produces, if, it's, if, it's, if you're underactive, you're gonna produce more of the inflammatory cytokines. If you have the right amount of zinc in homeostasis, you're gonna, you're gonna actually produce what you need, the right amount of uh, inflammation versus regulation of inflammation. At zinc excess, so this is a party and take as much as you want, um, you're gonna suppress T and B cell function. So it's uh, got problems on the uh, adaptive side and, it, and it, it, mess, it messes with the direction of macrophages to go and do the final killing and cleaning functions that they do. Also, if you have zinc to excess over a long period of time, you're gonna disrupt your copper metabolism at the same time. Again, in our pieces of data, is there evidence that zinc supplementation affects viral URIs? Yes, there is. This is a look at the, um, the upper respiratory tract infection colds, basically, and it's a supplementation with oral zinc. There's been a lot of discussion about whether you should be using zinc acetate or zinc gluconate. So here's the data. This is all the cold studies, some of which use zinc acetate and some of which use zinc gluconate, provided in a um, pastille or in a lozenge that you suck. So it looks like presentation in the mouth for this may be a very good way to use this. And the doses are higher than you might think. Um, so it does show a, a benefit, and the benefit's a little bit better for the zinc acetate than the zinc gluconate. Um, but again, it's a, probably a minor benefit. Uh, it's a, we do prefer zinc acetate, but it's not an absolute. It's not an absolute. So if you're going to do this, you're going to use zinc. You're going to want to give the doses that were used in the um, clinical trials. And that would be 13, about 13 milligrams of zinc per lozenge given six to eight times a day. 
Now, probiotics. We all know that probiotics are incredibly important for immune function. And we know that um, probiotics uh, tend to interact with the Peyer's patches in the gut and have a big effect on immune competency and immune function. So we're going to we're going to want to think about this as we're treating patients and as we're helping support patients because there's a lot of things that can be that are being done during this time that will disrupt sort of the normal flora of the gut and and also may affect some of the um, interaction of the of the of the microbiota with the gut wall so so probiotics um, we definitely know that in the in Chinese hospital a Chinese hospital study, doctors reported that patients had after after a couple, after a week of hospitalization or after in a more sustained hospitalization, they had decreased levels of Lactobacillus and Bifidobacter. These are the two primary probiotic entities that we know affect both the upper gut and the lower gut, and they're probably the two most commonly included species in probiotic supplementation. And we know they got affected just by being and a sick patient in the hospital. We also know that if you don't eat well and you don't have enough prebiotics, your probiotics um, uh, rigorousness, your, the, the, the strength and the um, ability to resist insults goes down in your microbiota. The less variable your microbiota is, the more likely it is that it's not as functional. So again, if you address your patients for nutritional status and GI function, you're gonna to wanna to be thinking about um, issues that will affect this. So you wanna make sure that along with all the other things I've already talked about, that you include a source of prebiotic for the patients that you're treating. Um, it's especially important to think about probiotics in the patients who are getting, getting uh, in antibiotics, either for a secondary infection or as prophylaxis. Because we know we have a lot of data, I'm not going to show it to you now, that probiotics given supplementally to hospitalized patients present the develop, pre prevent the development of C. difficile. Here they refer to it as bacterial translocation. So, and that's a, just a nasty, um, a nasty side effect to have to deal with. So they, the Chinese protocols are recommending use this for anybody with a secondary infection, recurrent fever, or long clinical course. Vitamin A, again, is another specific agent that's very useful for immune function. It's particularly useful for, um, for uh, again, these tight junctions and, and the, and the, and the, uh, and the uh, production of, of, of IgA. IgA is the immunoglobulin that's produced at the mucous membrane level in, as the first place that sees uh, an, a pathogen. Having tight junctions and having a robust um, IgA production will allow a good immune response. Okay, now, so that's pretty much the micronutrient portion of this, um, and I think you you can see the level of of the level of um, the level of uh, research. And here, there's not very much for the. Th Things I've already discussed, there's very little evidence of negative effect, and there is at least a, a good biological plausibility for use, and there's some direct evidence. So I would encourage you to keep this in mind as you're looking at your early patients, present, either early presenting patients or high risk patients. Mary, now, we're talking about, yes. Um, would you mind taking a couple questions on these, um, this kind sure. of topic, or do you sure. want? to keep going and just take everything at the end? Um, well, I, since I know that people may have to leave, I'm happy to answer some questions because I think this is the, this is the, there's a lot of other great stuff, but this is a lot of the meat of what I want to talk about. So yeah. yeah I, I think maybe we could take some questions from the Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, we had one question, um, let me see here. Um, is there any information about vitamin C levels and supplementation during cytokine storms or overactive immune systems coming from Dr. Ruby Kalra? Um, I don't know of that. I haven't read that data. But I would say you, you, vitamin C is water soluble. Therefore, it's, it doesn't store like some of the fat soluble vitamins. I don't think we have the same... Um, I don't think we have the same uh, tight relationship between vitamin D level and dosages that we have I mean, for vitamin C, we don't have that for vitamin D, at least I don't do that. Pretty much what I would say is that you should dose at the high levels I told you. The only issue with that high of a dose of vitamin C is usually the volume of fluid that you need to deliver that dose. So you have to make, so it's difficult in a patient who doesn't have active kidney function, for example. Um, 
but you have to assume that in a very, very sick patient, they've, they're going to consume whatever vitamin C you can give them. So I would, and also um, Jeannie Driscoll, who I think is the expert on giving IV vitamin C in cancer patients has said that um, for vitamin C given intravenously, it's not just the antioxidant function that you get, but that it creates hydrogen peroxide in the body, which is highly virucidal. Um, so that there may be more than one mechanism at work for vitamin C in this, um, in this time. I hope that was enough of an answer for your question. So. Great. We have another question coming in from um, Iris Irguter. Um, does vitamin D3 supplementation have to be stopped with symptomatic COVID-19 positive patients? Information from another um, practitioner recommended to hold vitamin D, then restart after symptoms improve. It's good to boost, boost the immune system and for prevention, but will this result in a cytokine storm in positive cases? Can you please clarify? Right. So I've seen, I've seen, um, I've seen theoretical discussions to that effect. And I would refer you back to the, uh, the vitamin D slide that I showed you. Because I think this is this is the key thing right here, this slide. If you if you're worried about inflammation, is the gateway to create the cytokine storm. Period. End of discussion. And the, and and it's also the outcome of the high production of inflammatory inflammatory uh, cytokines and other kinds of agents like that. And you see every opportunity where it's shown here. Uh, vitamin D actually regulates the uh, cytokine storm, and it looks like vitamin C does as well. So rather than removing vitamin D3 from anyone, I would actually maintain it and probably increase it. And I would certainly check their level, and I would make sure they're at least between 40 and 60 to have adequate immune competency to respond to this incredible stressor. So I, I know what people have talked about. I've showed you my evidence, and because of this, because of the stuff that's been shown from Europe and from China, I actually would not withdraw vitamin D, absolutely not. Now, if you're being given very high doses of vitamin D in the hospital, you're probably being given vitamin D2. We use vitamin D3 for oral supplementation as a dietary supplement. And in fact, vitamin D2 does convert to vitamin D3 in the body, but it's all about, you know, only about two thirds of it converts. So you can adjust those doses if you wanna use them for that, the big doses, 50 to 100,000, those are given to people who are acutely ill, it's recommended, and they're given to try to quickly get their vitamin D level up to both quell the cytokine storm and to improve their immune competency. So although I've seen those and I respect the people who've talked about it, um, I, I think we're making two theoretical cases and I have some hard data that I think suggests that vitamin D is helpful even in acutely ill people. Great, Mary. Another question around vitamin D, um, I want to be um, from Zochil to Palomino. I would want to be clear that vitamin D interacts with the adaptive immunity to manage or start resolution of the immune system and mitigate cytokine storm potentially, correct? Yes, exactly. And that was what I just showed you that um, that reference is very clear for that. So I think, you know, un until we actually have hard evidence that it's not helpful, I think thinking, thinking about we know most people are going to be low because most people are low anyway. And we have one of our fellows who's collected some data for us empirically too. We know that there's an association between vitamin D level up to about 80 nanograms per ml that it would at that below that level, you have a linear relationship between level of vitamin D and number of cases and severity of cases. And we have mechanistic evidence that vitamin D is actually a modulator of the cytokine storm rather than a provoker. Great. A couple more questions and then we'll let you keep going. Um, okay. From Dr. Tanase, hello, Anna. Uh, would you give melatonin as prevention or as treatment for confirmed cases? Uh -huh. That's interesting. I, 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 prop, I would, and you'll see at the end, I'll tell you what I, what I think I'm doing for my basic self and, and prevention and then what I do for moderately ill patients and more severe, severely ill patients. For me, I think the deal is um, I probably wouldn't necessarily give this unless people were having trouble sleeping, so I had another indication to give it, and then I'd probably be my preferred um, preferred uh, sleep aid, especially people were being disrupted in their sleep cycle if they were 
a first responder or a nurse or a doctor were having a lot more night shifts than usual or had to sleep more during the day, then melatonin is highly recommended there. And we might consider uh, people who have repeated exposure risk uh, might be a more uh, significant patient than someone we're just trying to do prevention for. So for that patient, that might be a reasonable thing to do, but I, would, I don't necessarily include it as our first line for prevention. But again, these are, this is, here's the data and anyone can, knowing their person, knowing their risk, knowing how they respond to melatonin, you know, you can, you can make it, uh, you can make a reasonable case using this data and knowing your patient and following them, so. Great, and the last question from uh, Rashida Ali, who's a- Oh, hi Rashida. Yeah. Uh, she's asking how um, can we supplement vitamin C, how about in babies under one year, and what about for prevention? Um, well, as always, if you have a baby, if they're still breastfeeding, most babies don't get to breastfeed that long, but if they are, you supplement the mother and it gets in the milk, that's always good. Um, if babies have started eating solid food, you can increase, you can make sure they're give, being given a lot of high vitamin C foods. And I got to tell you, since I'm an internist by training, that about does it for me and babies. So, um, <laughs> so uh, you know, I, at least that seems reasonable to me. Great. So. And I, one last question. Um, what do you know about ozone therapy via, via nasal cannula um, from Debbie mm -hmm. Califf? So Debbie is asking us if sending in um, ozone, which is presumptively will get into the lung and sort of act as a virucidal agent, um, that wasn't done in China. So I don't have any data, to t or at least I haven't seen any data from, th from them yet. And I haven't seen any data in general. Um, my, my first thought is, um, Ozone can also be a damaging agent. So you have patients who have like maybe four good alveoli left and you wanna really guard them. So since I know I have other things I can do that I know have a huge safety margin, I would do all those things before I would do something that I either didn't have a lot of guiding data for or had a theoretical potential risk of harm. Wonderful. So um, why don't you continue, and then if people please feel free to continue to at the end we'll, questions. We'll do some more questions so. in the Q and A. Okay. So now we're gonna um, we're gonna talk about adaptogens. This is a thing I've talked to some of you about before. It's, these are a special class of herbs that I think are just wonderful, and they also have actions that we don't really have drugs that do the same things. So I want to talk to you a little bit about this class, tell you some of their mechanisms of action, and then focus briefly on a couple of three or four of these that I think might be the most useful for you to think about. These were first brought out in Russia, in part because these were chemicals, uh, these were plants that had activity and they, some of them grew in Siberia, or in the northern steppes, and I imagine that there was an ethnopharmacologic, uh, i.e. they'd been used by native peoples, and that's how they first came to the attention of the Russian scientists. They were initially used to help maintain the health of patients in the Soviet system, well, workers, mostly in the Soviet system, who were in factories, and to prevent sick outages during the traditional cold and flu season. So um, this is defined as an agent that allows the body to counteract adverse stimuli, physical, chemical, biological, psychological stimuli, and the response is nonspecific. So it isn't like an antibiotic and a bacteria. It's a much more general rebalancing of the system. By definition, they also have to be non-toxic because they're often taken chronically. They have a nonspecific response and they build up the reserve of adaptive energy. They have a normalizing influence on physiology and it's, and it's bi-directional. So that's an unusual thing. Herbs often will have a, a, an effect that can act in both ways. It either promotes something or decrease something depending on the presentation of the subject. And here's what this looks like. This is a classic stress response up here on the blue dotted line. So first you have the initiation of the stress, that's the alarm phase, up goes the stress response, that eventually exhausts the organism, and then here's the phase of, of, of exhaustion, okay? Now this 
this may be good if you're like a soldier and you need to get right to something or um, you're thrown in the Atlantic Ocean for some reason you have to swim for your life. But this as a sustained state is not helpful and in fact depletes the body significantly. So the first thing the adaptogen does is damp down this effect. You get a stimulus so you can mount your defense, but it doesn't, it isn't overwhelming. And so it maintains sort of a homeostatic effect. So this fact, in this phase, it's stress protective. Now in the phase when the organism would normally be exhausted and a function would go below the baseline, this is in essence a stimulating effect. Again, normalizing function so that the, that's the organism, person, animal, whatever, maintains this uh, kind of much more level function. And this is called a heterostatic effect and the effect is towards homeostasis. Now, we know here's what stress does physiologically, just to remind us. So you get all, you get all your pre-event pre, um, pre stressors, loud noise, toxic environment, exposure to, to, to infectious things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you, you develop a stressful event, and it's either acute or chronic, and it's either low, medium, or high. You get the transition state reaction that we talked about at first, and then you enlist. You, you enlist two different systems primarily. You enlist the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system, and you uh, enlist the sympathetic nervous system. And these have a variety of functions, which you see here. Uh, cortisol on this side, uh, activity in the in the um, in the uh, in the in the neocortex, and then you end up, uh, and this is also on the on the capillary blood system. Then you end up with a bunch of cytokines back to inflammation, and then consistent cytokine presentation also leads to immune suppression, and that's the result of stress. There's a number of plants, and here's just not all of these I would consider have a strong um, a strong uh, uh, adaptogenic profile, but most of them, most of these do. So you hear about schizandra, you hear about licorice, you hear about eleutherococcus, sometimes called Siberian ginseng. Astragalus and licorice were two of the herbs that were most commonly used in China, which we'll hear about. So were certain species of ginseng. And reishi mushrooms also have, have a potential adaptogenic effect. Now, this is again, all kinds of activities, and this is a central nervous system glia, uh, uh, neuron. And you'll see here that the, these have tons and tons of activity, and they mostly act through um, intermediary, um, intermediary neurotransmitter uh, things. So here's glutamine again, um, GABA, uh, and then serotonin acetylcholine, again, re reactive oxygen, species, ATP, and you can see again here, there's again a regulation, down regulation of NF-kappa beta, and there's also up regulation of something called heat stress proteins, which we're going to find out oh, here, heat, heat stress proteins. These are um, produced in the face of overwhelming infection, and they tend to be protective. So anything that helps you with heat stress proteins, you're happy about. And again, looking at this again from another perspective, just a different, a simpler diagram in some ways. So here's the innate uh, antioxidant enzymes, SOD, a superoxide dismutase, catalase. These, these increase these agents and increase oxygen, uh, oxygen uh, um, species the reactive uh, component. And that if you, if you put in an adaptogen, again, heat shock proteins go up, the Jinkens system goes down, that's an inflammatory damage system. And then here, the, um, this again, this is again more in the, uh, in the uh, oxidative system that that's contributes to cancer uh, development. But you can see here, that these will all, these kinds of chaperone molecules will end up plugging back into the immune system. As we've talked about, heat shock protein again goes to immune stimulation, protective things in the um, in the uh, in the in, in the body, restorative proteins and restorative chaperones. And this again looks at the innate immune system and adaptive system, and it's going to help make those more functional. And and um, and again, it inhibits a lot of that inflammatory response. Now, the four adaptogens that I think are the most easily available and the most reasonable to consider are Siberian ginseng, American ginseng, ashwagandha. These are safe plants because by definition they have to be. Um, 
you'll find them available in many different formats. Um, they have they have they all support the immune system to varying degrees, and they all have sort of secondary activities. So, for example, American ginseng is a plant that's been tested, and um, polysaccharides have been isolated from this, which have been shown to reduce the incidence of a common cold. Um, Siberian ginseng was this hardiness protein that was used um, first used with the Russian workers and has been shown to reduce incidence of illness and ability to continue functioning. Ashwagandha is one of it's a Ayurvedic herb, and it's um, it's one of the few adaptogens that is actually kind of sedating. So an anxious patient in COVID lockdown, may, this may be a good thing for them. And rhodiola, um, besides being adaptogenic, has, uh, has been developed as a natural antidepressant with very good results. So someone who's harried, overwhelmed, can't keep all their things going together, but still needs support is a wonderful thing. Um, and I also, I probably would add one more to this. I probably would add schizandra. Um, this is a, another Chinese herb. It, 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 it balance, it's a very balanced herb. So it, it has all four tastes, salty, sweet, uh, bitter, and warm. And so it's got all of these tastes and it's a very nice balanced adaptogen. If you don't have a particular reason to pick one of the others or it's just a nice beginning adaptogen, that's another one you could, would, I would think about as well. So you can take these adaptogens and you can moderate them a bit to pick, to pick the best one for any given person you're looking at. Now, I don't often give Chinese ginseng as an adaptogen. It's awfully hot, very stimulating for people and because it's so valuable. It, it's it's a it's a product that often it, um, may has a higher risk of contamination because of of, of um, economic adulteration. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Now, without going into a long discussion, um, again, this is medicinal mushrooms and immunity. These polysaccharides have a from from water extracts of medicinal mushrooms. Reishi is a medicinal mushroom. There's a lot of them. There's shiitake, reishi. Uh, and a, a bunch of these that can be um, tramides, a lot of these that have been very useful in Chinese medicine for many years, Chinese and Japanese medicine for many years. And there's, there's great literature about immune activity effects on both the innate and the adaptive immune system. There has, I have not seen any evidence in clinical trials or in these, uh, these trials of, of um, mechanisms of action that support the uh, potential for immune overstimulation. And we've seen this reported as well. But again, these I have found these to be, I've used them a lot with cancer patients, and I've found them to be as close to a free lunch in the universe as you get. They have very little adverse effects. Water soluble, easily metabolized, et cetera. Now, it's really particularly interesting that um, coronavirus was, um, first came to national world attention through China. Because in China, the existence of a parallel medical system, traditional Chinese medicine is quite strong and fairly robust. So we have an ability to look back at what's just now starting to come out of China and see what they're saying about the use of traditional Chinese medicine for these viral illnesses. So traditional Chinese medicine was used for both H1N1, the swine flu, and SARS with anecdotally good results. Um, and there's a couple of clinical trials that I'll show you one of that does suggest it was a bit more rigorous. There was a meta-analysis. There has been some anecdotal reporting done from China. Um, a large number of patients were given um, traditional Chinese medicine as an adjunctive treatment. And what they say in the Chinese diagnostic system, for those of you who understand this and know how to work with this, that here's the four actions that they were working on doing. Tonifying qi to protect from external pathogens, and there's a, a kind of qi that's used to sort of create like a shield, and they're tonifying qi products that are particularly for that external qi, then to disperse wind, discharge heat, and resolve dampness. And Here's a look at what happened in the SARS coronavirus um, data that was used in the early in the disease. And again, using um, traditional Chinese formulas, there were two that were principally used, that they did show a, a, a reduction in risk and that they did show a decrease in um, NH1 influenza rate and, and additionally also for SARS. 
Now, what's interesting about this is this would be probably useful for preventative, general preventative, because most of these Chinese uh, adaptive formulas uh, are designed to be used to prevent infection and to prevent sickness. Um, there's a, a, a whole lot more data that's come out. So if you have an interest and, and are trained in traditional Chinese medicine, start looking for that literature because it will give you there's a couple of standard formulas that are being used and it looks like to good effect. So if that's your area of training, I would encourage you to search out, search out that data. Now just anecdotally what's been reported from China is this is a list of herbs um, that were used in these um, first early times using COVID. There probably will be more rigorous data coming out later, but this is at least the initial presentation. So um, uh, Huang Qi or astragalus root and guanzhou or uh, um, glyceriza, uh, the Chinese glyceriza, which is very similar to the European uh, licorice, were the two most commonly used herbs. Now, astragalus is an herb that we've also used for just general immune support and stimulation. And um, a, again, a very benign herb. Uh, I would caution you if you're going to include licorice in either form of licorice, either European licorice or Chinese licorice. Uh, over three grams a day, it causes a um, aldosterone-like effect. And so you get a pseudo hyperaldosterone syndrome, meaning that you retain fluid and you lose potassium. So again, the use of glyceriza should be limited. And in Chinese medicine, it's often added to formulas to be the driver of the formula. Um, so this may not be at high dose as an antiviral, although it does have antiviral activity in vitro. So it's important to understand that, um, that difference. Now, this is a summation of the individual herbs used in a variety of different formulas. So just to be clear about that. Now, here's the things that I've heard, and you guys probably have too. Silver can kill coronavirus. Um, there's been some very disreputable stuff on the internet. Um, and, and it's just not true. It's just not true. So you should not encourage your patients to do that. Um, I've also heard people talk about avoiding elderberry. This is a, um, a European herb that has an extracted form, has been used and been shown to reduce the incidence of influenza. It's again, a very benign herb. It tastes like juice, like fruit juice. When you, so if you have to give it to children, they'll be willing to choke it down. Um, and there's been concern that it might cause cytokine storm as via its in, in immune stimulation function. And I just, I've never seen that in the clinical trials. I've never seen that in clinical practice. And I've never seen it when I've been myself. So again, it doesn't mean it could never happen. It means that we have no direct evidence of that. Likewise for echinacea. And this goes back to the very beginning of the um, robust development of CAM when everybody was thinking of uh, wanting to be careful about potential side effects from natural medicines. And there was a whole discussion about giving echinacea to people who had autoimmune disease, and this might trigger an autoimmune storm. This, um, in all the 20 years that we've been looking for this, I, I've never seen it, and I don't, I've never seen publication that anyone else has either. So if you do know about that, let me know. So again, I think this is another one of those, probably not. Same thing with medicinal mushroom and polysaccharides, probably not. Um, and again, vitamin D, we had that discussion already. I would for sure make sure people are, um, have adequate amounts. And people are worried about ACE receptors and things that might simulate ACE receptors um, because the virus does bind through the ACE receptor on the cell. And again, um, there's no evidence from conventional medicine that continuing uh, ACE hypertensive medication, which definitely induces a, the formation of ACE receptors, has increased people's um, risk of, of mortality or worse clinical outcome, morbidity. So again, keep up with your lifestyle recommendations. Don't forget to emphasize these. It seems like it's such a benign, simple thing that doesn't make a difference, but I'll tell you, it actually really does. Now, for supplements possibilities, I would give people multiple vitamins so that they would get all those little selenium, vitamin A, zinc type stuff without having to have separate pills. I would, I would try to get people to 50 nanograms per ml as a minimum. If I don't know what their level is, anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 international units is useful. 1,000 to 3,000 milligrams of vitamin D. Zinc, I would give that if there's not any of the multiple vitamin. And I would, if I was gonna do that, I would consider lozenges. If, if you're someone who gets repeated 
repeatedly exposed, I would definitely include the zinc lozenges. Um, if you're someone who gets repeatedly exposed, you're at a very high risk, I probably would include adaptogens and potentially a medicinal mushroom. Now, other, supplement, other supplements to consider, um, glutathione, because it, again, either NAC indirectly or glutathione directly increases the, um, increases the natural antioxidant, quercetin, and a lot of bioflavonoids have been shown to have some effect. Zinc acetate, we said, was preferred. Some vitamin A, short-term only, long-term doses um, have a negative effect on osteoporosis, especially on necrosis of the hip. Green tea as a food is nice. Um, I wouldn't use it as a supplement now. And resveratrol has also been suggested another, another quercetin-like or high bioflavonoid product. After potential exposure or with uh, moderate disease to severe disease, I would consider higher dose vitamin D up to including rapid replacement in a critically ill patient. I would maximize oral vitamin C. I would, that's where I would add melatonin, probably three milligrams for a not very sick patient and 10 to 20 milligrams for a sicker patient. Probiotics if an antibiotic is offered and higher dose vitamin A for short term. Um, so that is pretty much what I ha have for you today. Thank you for your attention. And if you're a member of AIHM, please join our COVID-19 discussion group. We're just getting started and we're gonna be, that's gonna be a place for us to tell each other about interesting papers, interesting resources, ask and answer questions. And for people who are actively in the front line treating COVID patients to tell us what they know about them. And also to remind you of places where you can submit your patients into a, um, into a repository to, so that we can, at the end of this, look at the effect of, of uh, integrative medicine on COVID. And um, thank you so much for your time and attention, and I'll take whatever questions you have. Thank you, Mary. This was such a wonderful presentation, and we do have a few more questions, um, and then um, we, I can... We have time. Let's see here, let me pull up the questions here. We had one question about um, when, you're, when you take zinc, would you include copper? Um, again, at a lower dose, probably not, and at a, especially if you're eating meat. And if you, um, it, takes, it takes high doses in a while to get really out of copper, zinc copper balance. But if you're taking a multiple vitamin, they usually include small amounts of copper, so that's usually sufficient for that. Great. And do you have any recommendation that could help with lung fibrosis post-infection so that oxygen saturation can be improved? Well, um, you know, a pound of prevention is, a pinch of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So again, I would aggressively supplement with things that I think decrease fibrosis. There are some other Chinese herbs that potentially have been shown to help with fibrosis. Melatonin has been shown to help with fibrosis. Um, and so I guess what I would say is I would try to rigorously control inflammation in a patient who exited out of COVID, had some fibrosis, but still didn't completely resolve their inflammation. So that's an anti-inflammatory diet, curcumin um, potentially, and um, vitamin C, et cetera. And there's, again, um, there are some Chinese herbs that have been known to be useful for fibrosis. So I would consult your uh, associates who know about Chinese medicine and see what they recommend. And we're also going to be waiting to see, look at the, look at the, um, the formulas that have been used in Chinese medicine. Romani, I think, is one of the herbs that does that, and that's been included in a lot of these formulas. So we'll wait and see what happens. Wonderful. Well, again, I want to just thank everyone for coming and uh, just remind everyone as well, um, you know, us, we're, we're an interprofessional organization, the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. We're a membership organization and welcome you all to come and join. Um, for those of you who are members, like Dr. Hardy said, we have a COVID discussion group in the members only area. And we also can share slides and resources in that area. Um, if you are a member, for those of you who were not able to um, see the whole uh, presentation today. All of the videos are always on our YouTube channel um, at AIHM Global. Mm -hmm. um, as well, I just want to invite you all. Um, our next Friday wellness webinar will be put on by our esteemed fellowship director, Dr. Eric Capaluti. Dr. Capaluti is quadruple board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary disease, critical care, and integrative medicine. 
And so um, same time, same place at noon Pacific time next Friday, we'll be doing that. And then Monday mornings, for those of you who have been joining our Monday meditations at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time, um, my daughter Luna Sophia Guzman Parker will be giving a 15 minute meditation this week. Um, she is nine years old and she's very she's adorable. Excited she's adorable. Um, so please join us next Monday. Um, come out if you're interested uh, more in learning about some of these tools. Jo think about joining our fellowship. Dr. Hardy is a, a fellow faculty and teaches many courses, including herb drug interactions and botanical medicine. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want deeper content with there, we invite you to that. And I just really wanna thank our whole community. Um, thanks all of you who are on the front lines. Um, whatever we can do to help out, please let us know. We're here to serve you as the integrative community and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks again, um, Dr. Hardy for being here and being such a, just a wonderful resource uh, with this research. It's so important for us to really have a balanced view and be looking at how we can best serve our community. Because these things, get ignored and they i think have the potential to be so helpful so you stand up for the patient okay thank you, great. Gabby. Well, we'll see you monday or next friday thanks again everyone